Well, good morning to everyone that has just joined us and hello to everyone watching the replay. Welcome to another one of our online learning webinars. This time it's all about identifying and surveying a building with flood resilience measures. I'm your host, Andy Ferguson, and joining me this morning to take us through this webinar, I am pleased to welcome John Alexander, MD of Aquabex. We are about to start the main presentation. Just very quickly for those that, has, that have just joined us, if you are looking to post a question over the course of the webinar, I would encourage you to use the chat facility on the desktop that will run down the left or the right hand side. Just use the comment box and just literally fire over your question. If you, you can also fire questions either via email to myself, just to andy at property-care.org. That's andy at property-care.org. Or if you are socially savvy, you can use either Facebook, LinkedIn, or Twitter, and just use the native messaging facility there just to pose your question. John, I can see we're just pretty much hitting nine o'clock. Um, I can't comment for yourself, but certainly from my perspective, it feels and seems flooding is something that we need to consider almost with ever increasing risk. I mean, when I look at the last couple of years, we have seen increasing currencies of flooding. There's been, it seems to me, there's been greater media attention on flooding. And we've even seen London flood, I believe, what, twice over the last two, three years. I suppose whether you're in construction or whether you're a property building or, or surveying professional, if we aren't doing so already, we probably really need to take into account additional flood considerations into mind. But, and I do explain, but when it comes to buildings that already have flood resilience measures in place, how do we actually identify this? And what should building professionals and surveyors really be considering when surveying and reporting on buildings like this? Now, I know there's some big questions. Hopefully you can give us some wonderful answers, certainly to myself and to the audience as well, John. And I suppose I'll pass it over to yourself, good sir. Thanks, Andy, and uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, I see you're all suffering from the weather this morning, so uh, it's uh, quite appropriate that we are talking about uh, flood protection. So quickly, just a little introduction to myself. Um, as we said uh, in our conversation with Andy, Aquabex has been around since uh, 2010, uh, when we, we, we were, were instrumental in changing the marketplace. We'd been in the marketplace before that with other um, uh, company uh, manifestations since about 2000. But 2010 was a big change for us. We came up with a new quirky name for our company. Those of you with a, uh, a smattering of Latin might know that an OBEX is a barrier. Um, so we are a water barrier company. We are passionate about delivering the right solutions. Um, we will talk about insurance a long way, a lot of the way through this presentation. Uh, we are the, the only flood company in the UK that is associated with the insurance sector. And we are Aviva's uh, accredited uh, risk partner in that matter. We are thinkers. I think we're the thought leaders in the marketplace. We've created a, a very strong brand with Aquabex as well as being quirky. I think we are seen as subject matter experts in a number of uh, areas uh, and innovative thinkers. And for those of you that haven't worked out what um, an FPAS is, then uh, this is an innovative service that we've launched um, over the last few years, which is flood protection as a service. Uh, why, why buy equipment for, for a, certainly for community areas that's going to sit into a warehouse for many, many years uh, when you can actually hire it and actually hire a deployment service at the same time? So a lot of those thoughts are going to be coming out hopefully through, uh, through this uh, webinar. And please feel free to put, put questions into chat as we go through uh, and challenge my thinking because that's uh, how we will all learn. So what is PFR? I think it's important to know that, uh, I mean, this terminology has changed over the years. It used to be property level resilience. We're now talking just about 
uh, property level protection. We're now talking about property level resilience. And resilience means a lot of things to, to, to many people. In this instance, we're actually looking at two different uh, items. And it did take us a long time when we were working with Syria and CyWEM to come up with this naming and this strategy. But the two elements are, are keeping the water out, what the Americans refer to as, uh, as dry proofing. And, and we can do that in the UK quite successfully, particularly when we know that less less 80% of flooding is less than one foot. And we can actually protect most houses up to up to the meter. See some issues there with the different types of uh, building, certainly older properties with wattle and daub technologies, you wouldn't go much above uh, 300 millimeters. But for, for multi-story buildings with structural designs, you can go a lot higher. But what does flood resilience look like? Here's a few measures that, uh, that we can show you on the screen here. Um, it doesn't have to be on the house, as you can see from, from the bottom left over here, we have protected this one at the boundary and we've kept the, the, the water away from the house here. Uh, we've got a non-return valve just before we finish off the, the chamber here. We've got a, an internal sump pump, an air brick that we've replaced with a smart air brick. The, the flood door, one of the examples, as I said, we designed back in 2010. Behind my head, you can see a slot-in barrier that is down here. And over here in this McDonald's entrance, this is a passive barrier that we can do. This one here will have a grill at the front here. The water will come in and this barrier will float up all by itself. It's all very good and easy measures that, that we can put into place to keep the water out. And below ground, we've got a, a number of options. We, we like to take a, a hierarchical approach to this. The, uh, the preference is to put in a full port inline uh, dual flap valve. There's, there's lots of issues with non-return valves that I'm sure you, you would have come across in your time. Ragging being the biggest one where people put anything other than the, the three P's down, they are likely to get caught in, in any flat valves that, uh, that are around. Having two gives you a bit more of a safety factor in that. But where you've got no space to put in a chamber, then you can see this push fit valve down here. You can see how close to the wall we are here. We really had no option there. And then where there's no chambers at all, particularly in older houses or they've built over the chamber, then we end up with a manual device, uh, a, a pan seal, which you inflate with a bicycle pump and stick into the, the toilet's uh, rim. And then we talk about the other element, the uh, the wet proofing, as the Americans refer to it, uh, but we've now called this in, in the UK flood recovery. And this is where we allow the water into the building and then put as many measures into that building that makes it economically feasible to get back into that building as quickly as possible. And as with the, uh, the resistance measures, we will always have pumps in here because we're always looking at uh, retrofitting. Um, actually building new houses in floodplains is, rocket, is not rocket science. It's very easy to do. Um, it's just uh, a cost element that uh, property developers need to get their head around. But we're talking about the built environment and there we're always gonna get a degree of leakage. And as you saw before, we can only protect to a certain height so there's always the danger of over overtopping. So it's a, it's a measure of how we can achieve best in both of those. And we're gonna look at how we discover what the what is in the property beforehand. But when we get inside the property, you've gotta be aware that a lot of the measures that are in place are gonna be invisible to you. You're gonna see some uh, some obvious things, but I think the way the way around this as with uh, with the survey in general, is to have a good conversation with the customer as you're going through it. So here's a few examples of what you might see inside a property. Uh, we've got some rising butt hinges there in the middle. They're not as necessarily a flood measure, but what they do do is they allow you to lift off the internal doors and put them upstairs so that they're out of harm's way. Picture on the top right is of a uh, a plastic uh, kitchen that we've just recently installed in a property 
in Ironbridge. And I think the thing you will notice about it is it looks good. It doesn't look anything different from a from a an ordinary kitchen. We're not sacrificing looks for for protection on there. And those of you from the PCA and the tanking industry, you'll recognise the picture in the middle, which is the cavity membrane and the external, uh, the white around there is the external channel that, that takes the water away and, and pumps it away to the outside world. So when you go along and do your, your survey, the first thing you, you'll need to do is to, uh, is to go and check what the, the risk is at the, uh, at the property. Uh, I've put the links up there to the various countries, um, environment agencies, and, and I've given a picture there of, uh, of typical information that you will get from, from those websites. This is actually my home address. Right? Yeah, I do live in a flood zone, <laughs> albeit uh, a very, very minimal uh, risk around here. And, and typically my landlord uh, hasn't bothered putting any measures in place. The, the two maps that you'll see on the, on the website there will give you flood risks at various depths, and it will tell you what the uh, return periods are on here with um, the probabilities and which flood zones your properties are in. And these maps are there for river and sea flooding and also for surface water flooding. And it's important that you know what you're, you're looking at when it comes to the, the flood risk. But when you're on the property, if they've already got measures in place, I think you need to, to look about and what, it, what are you going to be looking to see out there? If they've got existing measures out there, then, then look for kite mark accreditations on them. They should be very visible on, on barriers with um, information on it. The one I have a picture of there is, is one that we would put on our doors, typically on the end of the door or in the, the door frame. So look for those and look for the markings on there. We've, we've put a QR code on there, so you've got ready access to a website and phone numbers to, to get back in touch as well. Accreditation is important. I think more and more the insurance sector is looking for products that are kite marked. If you, if you see something like the picture in the bottom there in the comment and you see that that's a, a DIY product, there's a very good chance that it doesn't work. Uh, a lot of people think it's easy to keep water out, but uh, our experience over trying to develop a flood door over the last 10 years has proven anything but. If you have as a hole in your door frame or a, uh, an inundation on it of one millimeter, you will fail the current BSI test. So it's really hard to, to keep the water out uh, around, around the properties. Make sure people have got warranties. You sh they should at least have a 12 or 24 month warranty around the products when they put in and check out the quality of the products. And we'll come back to that in, uh, in a little while. The other thing to, uh, to, be, to be looking out for is in the walls. Uh, this is your first line of defense. And, uh, and as you, you all know, if you're in the property game, walls are actually porous. Bricks are, are made out of meant to keep water out for very long. <laughs> uh, and unfortunately, with, with some uh, designs and buildings in, in properties, you will find things like weep holes and, and air bricks in there. These are good because they give you an indication of the property the design and things like that. I mean, the air bricks are in there to keep the ventilation through the, uh, the raised wooden flooring. So now you already know that you've got a, a, an issue within the building, potentially, if you've got groundwater flooding that you need to address. And also the, the picture on the, the left here shows what's, uh, what a weep vent will look like. Weep vents uh, are there to drain the cavity, uh, but they're also a really nice conduit to let the water back into, the, uh, into that same cavity. This is actually a, a weep vent. A lot of the time you will just find that people have just left out the mortar, so you won't find any there and there at all. Um, and one of our uh, competitors uh, and partners has actually developed a small one-way vent that you can actually put into the bottom of these holes here, seal up the rest and, and prevent that coming back into the property. But beware, these things are often hidden behind bushes and, uh, and cabinets and all sorts of stuff. And particularly with weep holes, you're going to find hundreds of these around the property uh, and trying to prevent these all 
and making sure you haven't missed any is, is a good challenge for you on part of your survey. Below ground is an area that most people miss when they go and do a survey. I, I, I always complain when, when I get independent surveys because everybody seems to be very reluctant to lift the cover. Uh, but lifting that cover is really, really important. Uh, and I've posed a little question for you on this one. On, on here, the, the main flow of the water is coming through here from left to right. And I don't know if you can make it out, but there are two entrances coming into this port here. But you might not need to protect both of them. Uh, and I wonder if you, you would like to put some comments into uh, chat as to why you think some of those ports might not require protection. If you are putting them in there, we go back to the um, to the hierarchy of uh, putting a new chamber in or putting a push fit into this existing one. But when you're doing that, then make sure that the homeowners are, are maintaining them. You should at least be lifting the cover and putting the hose pipe in here every so often and making sure that they're um, they're protected and maintained very well. And also you won't be able to see the drawing until you get a copy of the slides. But the other thing is if you can't, if you've flushed the toilets and you've run the taps and you can't find the flow coming into the manhole, then go and have a look for somewhere else because these things are often covered over in the drive with gravel. They're in the, uh, the flower beds. And, and again, the drawing that you can't see shows that there are actually two feeds into this house because there was an extension put onto it. There was another chamber put on a separate feed coming through. So in this particular instance, then you are going to, to need to put more than one NRV in here. But as some people have uh, rightly, rightly said on here that, uh, you know, if this is a downpipe that's coming from the drain, uh, sorry, from the gutter, into here, then you don't need it. And certainly if they've only got toilets and showers on the first floor, then we are not going to need to protect uh, anything at that level uh, unless we really are facing Armageddon. So not all pipes need need protection, just, just protect the ones that are, are necessary. The next thing to do really before you've even started looking at the property is to sort of consider the root cause and you know how does the the water get to your your property this is a uh, uh, some interesting photographs of a, a recent survey i was doing at a at a factory uh, up north um and i'm sure there's a few architects on here and i will say to you architects politely please stop putting doorways and entrances at the bottom of slopes particularly when that slope has an impermeable surface on it in this particular instance, the uh, the lorries were going over the gully, which is uh, going from left to right across the picture here, uh, and they were complaining that um, it was uncomfortable. So they plated over the gully here very conveniently. So now the water has got no chance of getting into the gully and is absolutely on its way into the factory entrance. So understanding pathways and receptors is uh, is important, and I think when you start looking at inner city dwellings and, and really referred to the one in, in London recently, I think that was back in July last year, a lot of dwellings in inner cities are below ground. And you can see some examples here where we've got the, um, the, the pathway where the water is running down the street, takes a left-hand turn into the basement where it meets your front door. There will also be another pathway in there because there's a drainage in there to keep the rainwater away and this will potentially be backing up and putting water back into that that same area other areas to to consider is where we what i refer to as captured um, this example is interesting uh, and again a recent one i looked at up in up in st albans had a nice french drain running all the way around it uh, but the french drain is you know it's only a couple of inches deep and really wasn't man enough to, to cater for all, actually in this case, just the rainfall that is falling into this area. Out of sight on the far end here either also is the downpipe for the, the gutter and the roof, which actually just emptied into the, uh, the uh, patio area there and didn't have any drainage taking it away 
anywhere. So it is just going to be filling up this area. So look about, look for areas like these. These are really important to understand. And don't forget rainfall when when you're considering flooding. It is it's adding to it, uh, and it will have an impact on on your requirements for the flood protection. And this case in particular is really good. And the the only way we're going to be able to solve this is to put some good quality pumping in here. And and now while we're on the subject of uh, of quality, then we, we come back to the point of you know, what does a good quality installation look like? And these are a few examples of some of our partners and, and installations that we've seen over the years. And you've got to remember, particularly, I mean, a lot of our focus today is on residential, although our solutions do come across, you know, um, all, to, all building types, whether that be retail or, or commerce. But when you're in the residential world, then aesthetics are really as important as the flood protection itself. So make sure that the work that you're looking at is good quality. Uh, you've, you've got the cooperation of the people to maintain and look after these, these barriers and things like that. Make sure the work is done well uh, and reinstalled to a good, a good extent. Make sure it's appropriate for what you're looking at here. You can see some, some measures and some ideas that we've come on, on here. Left over here. This was uh, an idea that we, we came up with rather than spending a lot of money on the property itself, we were able to divert the water away with just a simple railway sleeper wall. When you're looking inside the property, uh, again, this is something that's uh, a big, con big concern and a big contention point with a lot of homeowners is putting a trap door into the home is, uh, is, is very hard to convince customers to do. And very difficult to do if you're there after the reinstatement. But a lot of the measures we can do now with uh, sump pumps are to actually just feed the pipe through the wall and have the uh, the sump in the external garden as an alternative. So look, always look out for that as an alternative when you're looking at solutions and how they've been provided. And typically also when we're looking at uh, at um, garages with up and over doors, then often the easiest way to to address that. And it keeps the burglars away as well if people are deploying barriers when they're on holiday is to hide them inside the garage but uh, make sure they're done nicely and they're, they're put in place and effectively managed so then i guess what what does a bad installation look like and you're not going to be able to see a lot of the uh, the detail on here but I wonder if you again would care to put some comments in chat. The the three on the on the left hand side are are all typical of a uh, of issues where competitive products are put in without realizing the impacts of what they're doing. And there are two major issues with this type of solution. Um, be interested to see if you can pick up on on that on there. So I look forward to your your comments. The one in the middle, the uh, the pipe work on here. There's an there's an obvious uh, omission on here, uh, where we've got a pipe going through a wall which hasn't been sealed. But I wonder if you if you spotted the other obvious uh, flaw in that uh, in that solution. The bottom left is uh, is the the uh, detail of a of a flood door. And again, you might not be able to see this, but the, the, they've actually done a dry installation on here. Uh, there's no mastic covering off of these uh, these points on on here. And I always say that a that a flood a flood uh, door is only as good as the installation. And and the problem is is that you can't see how poor that installation is once the door's in. But if they can't be bothered to finish off the door at the outside, then there's a good a good chance that the uh, the quality is not uh, is not that good this one is very hard to spot i mean apart from the fact that they point in it's pretty poor uh one of these air bricks has actually been installed back to front um on the front of the air brick is uh, here is a kite mark sign uh which is missing on here so this air brick will actually just allow the water straight into the building this one again, when you see the example, uh, is is good. I mean, putting putting barriers inside buildings is good, 
And in this instance, it's the right thing to do. You've got an outward opening door. So, so putting the barrier on the inside is good. But what they haven't done and what I can't show you on this photograph is here, they haven't actually notched out the, the sill and the, uh, the skirt in here. So there's actually a very nice two inch gap down the back of the barrier on here. This particular one is just a very lazy installation. I mean, if uh, if the barrier fits over there and stops the water coming through the drain, uh, I think they'll be lucky. I think uh, I would like to see my installer move that uh, that drain cover. And going back to my obvious one, there's a non-return valve been installed in here on a uh, probably a dishwasher or a washing machine, but because the pipe above it is in the way, they decided to put it in upside down, guaranteeing that it will never close. So clear things to, to look out on there. Not, not for, for this conversation, but when, when we're doing flood risk assessments and surveying, uh, it's important that we we actually talk to customers and we understand these four elements of how to put a, a flood solution together. And, and we shouldn't be selling products. We should be selling solutions that meet all of these requirements from the customer. So when you're going around looking at what's been put, put into or, or maybe you're making recommendations for, for these on here, you need to address these yourself and understand when you're talking to the property owner, exactly what type of flood you're looking at. Is it is it a typical, just a one-off flood event or is it a cascading event? Is it uh, a groundwater long duration event? Is it a flash flood that's, that's here and gone in a matter of minutes or hours? And these, are, these will influence on the products that you put onto a property. If you've got flash flooding, you're not likely to want to bother too much about protecting the property or, sorry, the walls of the property, because it's not going to have enough time to seep through. Although you would want to look at um, any holes and and um, scouring in the in the wall there itself. But if it's long duration surface water flooding, greater than 24 hours, then you've got to look at protecting that wall and making sure the right solutions are in place. Have again, have we addressed and put the right products in place? Again, if it's a flash flood and somebody has sold them a manual barrier, that really hasn't addressed the problem that you're trying to do. Flash flooding really is only, the only answer is a passive or a normally closed solution, which is how we refer to doors. Have we addressed all of the issues? Again, going back to, to the, the uh, air bricks in the wall, we know it's a, a wooden floor now. If we've got a, a ground flooding solution, actually, have we stopped the water coming up through the floor? or have we just paid attention to, to protecting the air bricks? Sim simple methods of putting in pumps to manage that is really, really important. And the people issues are, are very, very important as well. We talk about dinkies, and I'm sure if everybody remembers uh, the dual income, no kids yet, uh, acronyms of many years ago, but also the gray nomads. These people are rarely at home. So if you, again, if you've got uh, flash flooding, you've got floods that don't have very long onsets, then barrier solutions aren't good unless they've got a good neighborhood scheme to go along with it. So these are all questions that you need to, to look at, not just looking at the product, but looking at the appropriateness of that product to, to the solution. One of the things we always talk about when we're doing flood protection is, you know, can we keep the water away from the property? The first thing I always tell my surveyors to do is to turn your back to the house, have a look around and see what's uh, what's defendable at that line there. But again, you, you need to ask the question, you know, is that appropriate? Um, typical questions, you know, does does the boundary go all the way around the property? Is it continuous? Um, and is it the right solution? Again, if it's a groundwater solution, then no, it's not there. That's that's not going to solve. The problem. This is good for flash flooding that uh, comes down the street and it's good for surface water flooding. But what about the impact of rain? You know, have you just created yourself a nice uh, lake inside this property here? Or has the solution included sump pumps in, in the garden and in the driveway 
to deal with the rainfall that's behind it. Someone asked a question about flows now, and, and it's very important, you know, you need to know where the flow is going. This example over here was uh, was quite simple. This was actually the road here was a, um, a pathway down to the river, and that's where they uh, where they launched the boats in. But the rain decided when it came to to come down the road here, take a left through the uh, the ladies' um, houses, and and flood the property. So in this instance, by by diverting it, we were just pushing it back into the into the river, which uh, didn't cause any any subsequent damage to people around there but you should be aware of where that flow is going um, although you are allowed by law to protect your own uh, own property uh, and keep it around there as long as it's done within your curtilage but being a good neighbor you want to make sure that you do deal with that uh, properly flood doors are a growing trend people always like these they're a much better option the, the great thing about them is as we we say they're normally closed so we don't have a an issue with them we go to bed we close and lock our doors and likewise when we go on holiday but there are numerous issues that we need to consider uh, around doors first one we've got over here we're saying we've we've actually put the flood door inside the porch here rather than at the porch uh, and good good reason for doing that is maybe the porch is not structurally sound. A lot of porches are just uh, PVC extensions. Some have just a, a small plinth wall, two or 300 millimeters high, uh, but it's only a single skin, which if it had a, uh, a three or 600 mil uh, flood against it could uh, just collapse. So here we've sacrificed the porch to, to protect it in us. And, and you'll see these solutions uh, very often when we look at conservatories as well, protecting at the inner door rather than the outer door. Heritage is always going to give you an issue. Um, you're very unlikely to put a UPVC door into a grade one house. Uh, so, you know, consider those when you're looking at uh, options around there. This is actually a fire exit flood door in the middle here. But often that's an, uh, an oxymoron. Is, uh, you've always got to look at the, again, the cascading effects. What happens if you have a fire and a flood at the same time? Can people actually get out? Uh, because once there's water behind a door that's outward opening, there's, there's no chance that you're going to um, open it up. So is it best to create a safe haven outside this door with, uh, with a plinth wall and a barrier on the outside so that people actually can get out of the building? And the other thing to to really consider again is uh, in the residential property if you've put flood doors everywhere how are the people going to get out of the property if they're in there if the event has happened overnight they come down to a flooded property and they've now been asked to evacuate you know where is their escape route uh, these are really important matters for for us to consider So now we're going to go inside the building at last uh, to have and see what's around and trying to find what uh, flood resilience measures have been put inside a house is actually quite difficult. There, there will be the obvious raised power sockets, not so obvious in the kitchen where they're always uh, at uh, counter level, but around the rest of the property, you might see these at a, at a raised level. We, we mentioned the, the rising butt hinges. And there are a number of uh, floodproof kitchens on the market. You know, there's some industrial versions that are, are made out of steel and aluminium. There's more and more products coming to the market now from uh, plastic wood and engineered wood suppliers that are coming to the marketplace. And these, these can be supplied as either uh, bespoke kitchens for high net worth individuals, high end kitchens, or just as a carcass only solution with lift off doors. These are all options that, that you should be looking out for. The floors might be tiled. Um, we're just uh, fitted uh, rather than fitted carpets. They'll just have throws around there. If you're examining the floor, it's, it's always good to ask and talk to the customer about whether the grouting is of a good marine quality. Find out whether the, uh, the tiles have been put in there with marine uh, adhesives. I mean, treat this like a swimming pool solution and make sure that's that's done correctly 
or the uh, there's hardwood skirting boards or some new plastic or tiled skirting is more much more re re resilient. But also a question to ask as well, if um, if the house has got a, a nice tanking solution in it, have they actually connected that that tank solution, particularly if it's a, a slurry or a uh, membrane, does it connect to the flood door or the flood barrier? If there's a gap in it, then then water is going to come through um, and you've got to investigate and interrogate the customer to see um, how that's coming through. If it's a membrane system, then check that it's been installed to, to the right standards, to the right, there's a, there's a new version of the, the British standard um, out there. And check the PCA website to, to make sure that, uh, that there's an accredited installer in there and check the guarantees, make sure that this is a, a viable solution that's gonna, that's gonna outlive the, uh, the property and do, do well. And the Build Back Better scheme that is now being promoted by, by Flood Re is going to present a lot of challenges. And we'll, we'll get into a bit more detail about this. But again, the fact that you can't see what's going on um, once the solution has been in, put in place, it's good to, to, to ask the customer if they've kept a record of, uh, of what was happening as it, um, as it went through. And that, that evidence is, is quite important as, as you know, as we will see going forward uh, when we start getting into conveyancing uh, and moves on the houses is to people knowing what the right things are to do. Here's an example of a property we're, we're working on in Ironbridge that is flooded three times. So we've evidenced a rip out here on, on the side here in the conservatory. We've evidence putting closed cell insulation back into that cavity. This is a really good flood protection measure as well as uh, insulation. And we've evidenced the fact that we've taped the joints and we've sealed them into there. And this is going to form a record for, for when this person uh, is, is moving on from this property uh, and will form part of the deeds uh, as she goes through uh, and going on there. <clears throat> The other thing we want to talk about is when we're looking at the prop properties and products that you're looking at there, you might find that some of the properties, the, the quality of the products put into there, claim that they're waterproof. Uh, and there's a lot of that, particularly with wall, cavity, wall um, um, treatments that go into the wall, and a lot of people will claim waterproof, in, and they are. They will keep the, the water and the weather out. It's very, very unlikely they'll keep uh, the, the the flooding out, uh, and it does need that, that we need to put... Uh, the right solutions on there. So when we're looking at waterproofing, then make sure we are looking at the right solutions. And an example of that would be on the on the walls. And there's a lot of new nanotechnologies that are out there at the moment. I think those of you that know what a uh, breeze block looks like and how porous it is, will see that if you've got a good treatment around it and you can keep the water out to this effect, then that is is definitely a floodproof solution. Whereas the uh, the the waterproof solution over here is not doing quite so well. Manganese oxide boards are made from, from that material. They are um, a granite-like material that will keep water uh, away from the building. They won't absorb water into the building, uh, so they will retain it. It's expensive, so we only recommend putting it on horizontally around the building and then put the gypsum board above that. But it does mean you don't have expensive ripouts and drying and you are looking to get the people back into the properties quicker. And the advice for your customers is, you know, maintain what you've got there. You'll get guarantees from, from your suppliers, which is which should be at least two years. Pumps will, will have probably five year lives on them. And, and certainly there should be insurance back guarantees around a lot of the cavity insulations around there. Make sure you know what's in the house. Uh, and make sure you know where the fixing points are. If you want to put a new radiator on the house, make sure that the supplier is giving you the right fixings. Don't go drilling holes straight away and just fitting these things in willy nilly. Uh, unlike, and unlike one of our customers, please don't put a cat flap into your flood door. And maintain everything all the time. Uh, we used to have a competitor that talked about fit and forget. 
Uh, and we always used to tidy that up by saying, fit and forget at your peril. Always make sure that you maintain your products, store them well uh, and, and maintain them. And doors, because you're using the door every day, it it's, gets a lot of use and abuse. Uh, and it's uh, essential that you do keep a good maintenance on it. Check the, uh, the door is closing properly. Check the gaskets aren't deteriorating. Check your non-return valves. Uh, you know, winterization is a is a term we use all the time. Actually, Make, making sure lift that lid on the on the NRV, put the hose pipe down it. Make sure it's uh, it's working properly. If if you are prone to putting stuff down the toilets, try and get out of that habit. Stop putting fog, fats, oils, and greases down your sink. Put it into a cup beside the uh, the sink. The, Fog is the cause of about 80% of flooding in sewers, and it's really uh, a lot of industrial users and kitchens that, that put that down there are causing problems for themselves. And it's congealing, much like your, your lungs do when you smoke. One of the things we learned of the hard way was when we, we, we do put these um, NRVs on dishwashers and washing machines is because when they freeze up, then your washing machine will back up and and uh, flood your kitchen so where possible try and make sure that they're on the inside of the property clean out those uh, air vents get rid of the the nests and the the insects uh, away from that and again check the seals when we do our flood protection we use a a guide to guide us through that to make sure that we are addressing all the points and the bit that behind my head that you can't see is if we can't provide a solution that's insurable, then we haven't done our job uh, very well. Uh, that's how all of our measures should be uh, gauged. And that's what you should be looking for when you go around and do your, your surveying. So in summary, uh, talk to homeowners. It's, um, it's empowerment that you understand the flood risk, understand what it is, understand all those issues, not just with the property, but with the people as well. PFR is a combination, but most people still want to keep the water out. So most of the time you will be just looking at, uh, at flood resistance measures. Uh, build back better is very hard to get right. Um, that's a whole subject matter on its own. Be happy to talk to everybody about that. Uh, include pumps and make sure it's insurable. Thanks for listening. Uh, my contact details are there um we're always happy to talk to people if you've got uh, questions then you know happy to talk to you and share our, our knowledge with you well john here well firstly main thanks for sharing uh, that presentation and also sharing your knowledge and wisdom um towards what we should be firstly looking out for and how we should be surveying properties with pro uh, but property flood resilience measures. I clearly have not had enough coffee this morning. I think I definitely get some more. But here, guys, moving on to questions. Um, now, just to let you know, if you do have a question that you do want to throw at us, we don't have a lot of questions at the moment. So most likely, you we can probably get that question in. So feel free to use the chat and pose your question there. Also, as well, if you just want to pose your question, as many do, via email to me, it's just andy at property-care.org. So, um, John, kind of starting off with um, the the questions that were coming in. Um, first question comes in via email from Sam, Samuel Akintundi, hopefully I pronounced your surname correctly there. Now, Samuel's actually gone into um, something that you've already kind of touched on on the presentation, but maybe you can expand on it a little bit. Well, Sam, Samuel was asking, you mentioned insurance a couple of times through the presentation. Now, as a surveyor that may be inspecting a property with property resilience measures, how does he understand if he recognises flood products have been installed? How does he understand that these are fit for purpose and potentially covered by the insurance industry. Now, I know you picked up on some of the things about the flags, the barcodes and etc. But I mean, a lot of the people on today will, will, won't have a clue in terms of the products and how good they are. Is there any other tips you can maybe give surveyors and inspectors out there? 
Yeah, this is a very difficult area because I think the insurance sector is very slowly coming to recognise um, flood measures. They're still very reluctant to uh, to do anything redu reduction in um, in excesses or or premiums for barriers. They they have a a mental block around around barriers for some reason, um, and I think it's the element of human intervention that is the the issue around that. Um, although we've always argued that the same applies to whether you set your burger alarm or not, you still have to have human invention, intervention there. So I, I think it's a way that they are trying to avoid the issue. But you are you, you, the, the kite mark is the real uh, differentiator between products here. Um, you know, they're a step above DIY products. They're also a step above a lot of products that's in the marketplace. But even with kite mark products, you've got to look at the quality of that installation. You know, my, I was talking about the doors on there as well. I mean, I would argue that Aquabex's door is the best in the world. I'd also argue if it's installed badly, it's the worst in the world. By the way, so, we're not promoting just Aquabex. There is lots of other products just out there. Just so let me point that out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There are yeah. other products. Like I say, when, in, when installed uh, badly, then they are not a good quality product at all. So mm. it's it's understanding how well those products have been installed, how well they've been maintained. And I, I do think going forward to get the insurance sector more and more involved, I think warranties and maintenance is going to be tied mm. into insurance premiums in the, in the future. And I think that is the way forward. We're already seeing it in the commercial world. I think it will come more and more into, into the residential premiums as well. And I think you're actually right there, John, I, especially with the, um, um, the, the areas that are increasingly being flagged as risk of flooding. And you could put that down for a variety of reasons, I suppose, one being climate change. Um, but certainly in your evidence is what's happening in London over the last couple of years and the flooding that's taking place there. What you're suggesting wouldn't surprise me. So again, moving on to next question. Next question comes from Ashley Cole. Um, Ashley's asking, if, is there any um, RICS or recommended guidance documents that actually help advise surveyors on how to appropriately survey Properties with flood protection in place. I mean, I, I, I mean, the, to the best of your knowledge, is there anything that directly answers that question, or at least maybe other documents might be able to point her to? So run that by me again, uh, Andy. I'm sorry, just go go through. Yeah, she's asking. She's asking. Well, I, I'm, I'm assuming Ashley is RICS qualified because she's asking specifically. Is there any RICS or other recommended guidance documents that help advise surveyors on how to appropriately survey properties with flood protection in place? No, so I say the short answer is no. Um, there is a, a good British standard for below ground uh, structures. I'm sure any PCA member will know it better than, than, than I do, but there isn't really anything um, for above ground, it's just there is a product standard for for doors and uh, and barriers, which is the the BS eight five double one double eight, but that doesn't really talk about the the property as a whole. There's really nothing that looks uh, holistically at how you would go about doing that. And I think this is one of the issues we've had in our industry for a long time. Uh, you know, you've got RIS, uh, RICS. Uh, qualified surveyors that are experts in the built environment. You've got uh, surveyors that are uh, flood surveyors that are experts in hydrology and geology, and they understand that. And and there there is actually a big missing gap there of people that are actually experts in both. Mm. Um, and that's really what the, the gap that we're trying to bridge with our learning and our experience over the years is is to put those two skills together and come up with solutions. But a lot of it is is experience and learning uh, and, and you know, and collaboration with people that have got best in class skills around that. But there is really nothing out there as good guidance really at the moment. All righty. Well, uh, guys, one thing I would say is that, you know, if, you, if anyone has any recommendations out there to help Ashley, then please do just chuck it into the chat. 
that would be fabulous. But kind okay, of moving on, next question comes from Drew Kirkland Crawford. Um, he's asking, how do you find support or knowledge from loss adjusters and insurers regarding Build Back Better and other property flood resilience initiatives? I think it's mixed. Um, there's some, there are some surveyors out there and loss adjusters that are ahead of the game um, that are, we, we, you know, we work with a lot. Um, uh, and uh, you know, just to throw a name out there, I would say that Sedgwick is is probably a, a really good leading loss adjuster at the moment. Uh, that has been, you know, champion championing build back better with the insurance industry to do that. But it's actually, you know, I I've always thought that when we've had flooding in the past, that is the loss adjusters that we really need to educate uh, their, their their insurers and homeowners to put the right things back there. And I think we need to train those people up as our eyes and ears on the ground. These are the people that are really gonna make a difference to putting that property back together again. And instead of just doing the mass rip out that we are, are used to now, um, and particularly if we start doing build back better, if we start getting loss adjusters in there that actually don't know what build back better is, all we're gonna be doing is ripping out really, really expensive, good quality solutions and putting it back in again. So absolutely, we've got to, got to get those guys on board. I think they are in a position to, and willing to learn. Uh, and I think once they, they understand what can be done, I think they are the way forward and the future for, for us getting Build Back Better up and running. All right. Well, my next question is a little bit of a controversial question, but I'm intrigued to maybe see what you think, John, here. Now, the question comes from Giovanni. Um, Giovanni, I've slightly just to let you know, just tweet your question just a little bit. But he's asking, in terms of which return period or annual probability, um, in terms of kind of flooding, what would you consider acceptable for considering or not considering flood resilience measures? Now, that is a wee bit of a finger in the air, because if I was ever to be flooded once, I would personally be considering flood resilience measures immediately. But is there, I mean, just from your perspective, what, what do you think? Well, to answer your question quickly, most people will flood three times before they'll do something about it. Oh, wow. Um, and that's a statistic from, uh, from the old Aviva, Norwich Union, from many years ago. Uh, but to ask Giovanni's uh, statement, it's, that's quite easy, actually. Insurance uh, premiums, they always look at uh, a one in a 75 year flood event, uh, and that's what they're willing to insure uh, as, a, as their standard policy. So that's, uh, that's really what we base our, our learning on. But, but then for coming back from, from the probabilities, the return periods, the other thing we look at is we just look at the the propensity of flooding in that in that area and what we can achieve and we will look to always put in barriers at up to 600 millimeters um we wouldn't necessarily go to into the flood resilience and i and i think there's a lot of hype around the fact that this new stuff's coming out there but build back better is only necessarily when it gets inside the building there's lots of ways to stop the water getting in the building in the first place there's lots of cheap ways to stop that water getting in your property you don't have to go for that full-blown expense and i think that's one of the things that we we need to impart on people people don't want to spend money on flood protection it's it's what we call a grudge purchase mm. so you know it's, if we can keep that money down that spend down to its uh, lowest level then we can encourage people to do more with their property so that we don't have that conversation about who i or don't i we make it easily affordable for them to do and say yes, regardless of the return period. Okay, well, hopefully that answers your question, Giovanni. Um, I'm moving on to Nancy O'Keefe. Nancy's um, switching the conversation towards flood maps. Now, she's asking just on your personal opinion, do you think flood maps are correct or to a certain degree, just random estimates? Now, she's realizing, she's giving some context here, to say that certainly from her perspective in Ireland, um, she feels a lot of the flood maps are just guesswork and not actually accurate 
I mean, in your opinion, from the flood maps that you've seen, what, what do you think? Um, I think they're accurate to a degree. Um, you know, they, they, they're coarse in, in their nature um, uh, and they don't always pick up some of the nuances. So I would say they're a good desktop study. And when we when we go and do a, a survey, we will always refer to either the EA one or we'll go to a, a private uh, company like JBA or um, environmental uh, protection people and get uh, a flood map. The, the limitations on them are typically that they're only looking at surface water flooding and river flooding. Then there's no good mapping for flash flooding around. And I think the issue, and also the, the other the other thing that is very apparent is that they don't take into account sewer flooding. So none of that is 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 apparent in any of the maps. So there's, there's some big areas missing out there. Um, and there's a lot of hidden culverts and, and rivers that have been cul culverted over that are, are not showing accurately on, on some maps. So they're good as a, as a, as a starting point. But you will always need to go to site to understand the topology mm -hmm. and, and to understand the differences of, of that site. You know, and, and the, even the way that the building has been situated in the land can have a different impact on the flooding aspect of it, regardless of what the map says. It could, if the door's around the other side and it's on the upside of the hill, then, you know, the flood risk is much more reduced. So they're a good starting point. Uh, and some of the, pr the private maps are, are more detailed. They've got more depth uh, information on them. Um, but you, you, it does, nothing beats going to site and having a look in, around physically. Well, John, uh, yeah, the, the, I've actually got a question from, my, from, my, from myself, actually. It's not actually been posed by someone, but it's off the back of just from what I've been hearing. Uh, now, this may be a daft question, and if it is, I apologise in advance. But for... For a, 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 a property or surveying professional that might be turning up to a property, um, out with them maybe asking the homeowner or doing their due diligence and looking at the property to actually see is there any visual flags in terms of to indicate that there's flood resilience measures here. Is there like a place online before that inspector or surveyor goes to the property that they could actually take a look to actually see has the property been flooded before and as such there's been insurance claims against that property which maybe then gives an indicator for that severe or property professional before they even go along to the property I mean is that just is that just pie in the sky or or is there something out there um I would say every insurance company in the land has that information hmm. Uh, but they don't share it. Uh, yeah. It's it's you know it's the crown jewels for for those insurers, and it's how they they write their risks. So absolutely, that information is available. Um, I do remember uh, many years ago we were looking for some grant funding from from Defra and BRE to actually record all of the data of all of the measures that's been put in place through the various grant schemes that. Uh, DEFRA and EA and the councils are put together. Um, well, um, we were we're lacking in that, but there there should be a central database of everything that's been grant funded, but sadly it doesn't exist. All right. Okay. Well, my last question to you, just before we kind of sum up, because we're getting to that time. Last question actually comes from Peter Gorman. Um, Peter's asking, um, I'm. Well, he's, he's mentioned that he's seeing an increasing number of properties flood caused by lack of maintenance of rivers and streams. I mean, from your perspective, who is responsible here for that? Is it the council, for example, or because of the lack of doing it, or is it seen as an act of God? <laughs> yeah. uh, well, Mr. Mr. Pitt, back in uh, 2017 actually he spelled spelt all this out uh, and the but the problem is is there's split responsibility uh main rivers and uh the coastal is uh, is the environment agency uh streams and minor rivers are, are local authority apparently the definition of a, of a stream is something you can jump over um uh, so you know when people see these issues around they they actually don't know 
who to go to. And I think uh, mm. uh, I some summed this up, you know, all those years ago, saying that this needs to be one single body needs to be responsible for that because yes. when people see water around the house, they really don't care how it's got there. They just want to have one person to talk to to uh, to solve that problem, uh, and it hasn't it hasn't been addressed really. Mm. No. Well, here, folks, thanks for everyone posing questions to us over the course of the webinar. Um, there is one or two questions that I didn't manage to ask, but what I will do is I'll pass them over to John, and I'll ask John if he can, if he has the time, that he can maybe kind of get back to you just on an answer towards those questions. Um, for anyone that wants any additional information on terms of blood resilience or Blood protection. I've just got up on the screen here just a couple of places you can go to. Starting off with the the PCA floods um, protection library, you can see the link up there. There's lots of guidance, information, help, and best practice on there. But there are a variety of other places you can go to, and I've got it listed up there. Syria has um, its its code of practice, as you heard John. I looked to earlier on in the presentation. Flood RE is also a very good source of information. The Chartered Institute of Water and Environment Management as well. We did a webinar with um, them about, oh God, about almost a year ago now. Lots of really good information there. And as well, government sources and environmental agencies. There will be, of course, this webinar recording that should be available from some point tomorrow. Now, just in case there are those that are interested in learning a little bit more about flood resilience at PC, we do do a bit of training on property flood resilience. If you are interested in learning a little bit more, then you can just simply contact our team. But there are other areas as well where you can gain um, some information, help, advice, guidance or other training. I mentioned about the CIWEM. There are um, courses there as well if you want to try and gear yourself up. But we also, as well as the PCA, we have a CPD video library and a section for um, flood related um, information for professionals. So the link is on the screen there. If you want to go to it, feel free and I would encourage you to go to it. Just before we sign off, I just want to make you aware of the next webinar that's coming up. Next webinar is all about the advantages and use of leak detection systems. Now, this is actually an extension of a presentation that we did during the 2022 International Structural Waterproofing Conference, where um, um, si uh, Simon introduced us, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> my apologies there, Simon introduced us to the advantages of electronic leak de detection systems in this presentation. We are actually expanding on that 20 minute presentation and going into a little bit more detail, not only from a new build perspective, but also from existing buildings, podium decks and basements. So I hope you will join us. The link is on the screen there if you want to register for the webinar. Uh, last but not least, I just want to say firstly, a big thank you to yourself, John for coming on board here, sharing your knowledge and empowering us with a little bit more learning than what we actually had. I want to say a big thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us this morning and tuning in. And last but not least, I just want to say to everyone, I hope you have a lovely rest of the morning and hopefully we see you at our last webinar for 2022 on the 1st of December. So goodbye, everyone, and take care. Bye, all.